Well, greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and Corbin University. And it is a great privilege for me to be here with you today. And uh, Ryan Connor is, uh, is Professor Ryan Connor, where I come from. And my, uh, our, my wife Barbara's here. And our second son, Jonathan, just finished his uh, master's in clinical mental health counseling. For, and one of his favorite professors is uh, Professor Connor. And he's been a a great influence on our son. So thank you for sharing him with Corbin University. Uh, He has a very significant role. And uh, he he stops by my office. I stop by his. He uh, preached in chapel uh, not too long ago, did a great job. And so again, thank you for sharing him with us. So today I'd like us to talk about discipleship. And I, I think it's one of those... Areas that is uh, really, really important. And so as we, as we think about that, I have a little quiz for us. And so if you just put that first one up, uh, don't give the answer away. But I want to see if you know who, who mentored, who, who discipled who. Um, anybody know Steve Jobs? Yes, Mr. Apple himself. Who did he uh, mentor? Mark Zuckerberg, you might have heard of the man who invented Facebook. How about um, Dr. Benjamin Mays? He mentored, anybody? Martin Luther King Jr. Mm, Okay, how about uh, Luther Powell? Got nothing. Okay, great. Okay, all right, next. Uh, General Colin Powell, who was the former Secretary of State. Uh, how about this one? Virginia May McClanahan Runner. She mentored, and if you get this, you're amazing. Clint Eastwood. Notice what he said about his grandmother. Isn't that great? She had a great impact on his life. Okay, now let's go on to the fictional category, kind of like we're playing um, Jeopardy here. Okay, Professor Dumbledore. Harry Potter, yes, Uh, and notice the last line, one can never have enough socks. I think that's my daughter's mantra for life. Uh, How about uh, Yoda? All right, Luke Skywalker, good, good, and I love the line there is is great. How about uh, Mr. Miyagi? Daniel San, that's right, okay, from the Karate Kid. All right, and I love the line there, man who catch fly with chopsticks accomplish anything. Yes, got to love camera tricks, as my dad would call them. All right, uh, Agent K, he mentored his name in the movie. Okay, let's go on to that one. Agent J, all right. A person is smart. People are dumb. Panicky, dangerous animals, and you know. <laughs> okay. All right. Finally, Aslan. He mentored the Pevensey children. And if you can name them, that is, remember, Peter, Lucy, Susan, and Edmund. And, uh, and so these are a crucial things. So... There is mentorship everywhere. There is uh, discipleship everywhere. But from a Christian standpoint, I think that there is a real clear focus to this. And so what I want to do first is talk about what discipleship is not. So what discipleship is not. What being a disciple, first of all, is not being a fan. And and, uh, uh, how many Seahawks fans out there? Okay. How many are still OSU fans? Okay. Anyway. All right. Okay. But uh, uh, often we, there is a, an author, a Christian author, that uh, his title of his book was something to the effect of, of not a fan. Uh, and that following Christ is not just when it's good and when you're winning, um, or not just because you inherited it, it's because of being a follower. And so um, it's not just a student of knowledge either. Uh, often we, we get... Um, in our minds about knowing things is, is what, what we do when we reproduce ourselves and others. Another is just uh, a practitioner of skills. That's what, it, what a disciple is. Um, but that's, that's not what it is. So um, it's not merely, next slide, is uh, it's not really mere coaching. 
Now, again, I think there's elements of coaching that is a part of discipleship, but it's, and it's also not mere mentoring. Uh, mentoring can tend to be dis, uh, the mentee's um, desire, and also uh, they control the shots. But uh, um, I think Christian mentoring is more what we would call discipleship. And, uh, and so it's not just getting new skills or getting new knowledge or for a certain um, uh, career development. Uh, I, I hope you know your pastor mentors many people at Corbin University. But discipleship is, is a little different, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. So what is discipleship? That's what we need to talk about. Uh, it is a, a fascinating study, and I think theologically, I, 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 that's what I teach at Corbin. It's just the way I'm built. I like to see um, things as far as themes. It's, God has created themes in the scriptures that are like his fingerprints all over it. And, and they are, it's a masterful idea of weaving themes throughout it because he's got the same mind, the same priorities, the same goals, the same thoughts throughout the scriptures because all scripture is inspired by God, right? And so we get the opportunity to look at these themes and they are much more majestic than my nine-year-old ashtray that I made for my dad in, in uh, third grade. And so these are things that are, are powerful themes. And, and so I think that staying in one passage can limit us to a certain extent when we're trying to look at, at this concept of discipleship. So looking at discipleship, I think the first thing that we need to recognize is that it comes from a, a couple of Greek terms, and, and that's not really the, the point here. But as you look at the first one, is, uh, it is the concept of mathetes, which is a learner. And as you look at these passages, I want you to notice what's associated with them. Notice in Acts 9.1, and this is uh, about the, the Saul before, before he became the Apostle Paul. But Saul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Notice, of the Lord. And you look at uh, Acts eleven twenty six. So in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, if you think about the term Christian back in that day, it was a mocking term. Oh, you little Christ followers. Oh, you little Christ. You just want to be like him. And he, and it's, it was a mocking term for, for people who were, who were uh, people who followed Christ. So as you look at this, this is about being identified uh, the, of our whole lives and for our whole lives uh, of being uh, identified with Christ. The next one is uh, the idea of this term, akalutheo, and you will be quizzed, quizzed on that afterwards, uh, but no, you won't. Uh, but what is associated with here? If you look at the passages, uh, Mark 16, 24, then Jesus told his disciples, he says, if anyone would come after me, so the term akalitheo means to follow. And so every time this term is used with the disciples, it's following him, come after him, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And so this is a, a crucial set of ideas that are all wrapped together, that it, it is a sacrificial act, and when he calls, we listen. Uh, John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. It's about knowing Christ. It's about listening to him. And then uh, 1 Peter 2, 21, for this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. And so as you can see there, Christ also, he call, it's listening to Christ's call. When he calls, we listen. But more than that, we listen and join him at all cost. And it's associated with the, the concepts of, um, of intimacy, of closeness, purpose, and cost. So when, when and you heard this phrase before, uh, being a Christ follower. I, I hear this term a lot in, in our, our country, uh, being a Jesus follower or a Christ follower. That's really what it is. And so we, we need to make sure we do this. So as Christ followers, the lordship of Christ changes everything. In the late 1800s, there was a, a, a famous evangelist and pastor by the name of Andrew Murray. And he wrote this book that is just absolutely profound. He was what we call all in. And being all in, he wrote this statement. Uh, next slide. Um, 
Notice what he says. And he pleads with people. Oh, come and cast off this self-life and flesh life that, at the feet of Jesus. Then trust him. Do not worry yourself with trying to understand all about it, but come in the living faith that Christ will come into you with the power of his death and the power of his life. And then the Holy Spirit will bring the whole Christ, Christ crucified and risen and living in glory into your heart. This is really kind of the passion and the nuts and bolts of, of being a Christ follower. It starts with giving our whole lives to Christ. Whatever you want, Christ, I'll do it. I'm all in. And then we allow him to fill us and we allow his spirit to fill us and the Holy Spirit mediates his presence to us. So we're never away from Christ, but we can always at times follow our own desires and put him in the back seat. And we need to make sure that we recognize that the, the following of Christ, the Lordship of Christ changes everything. Now, what's really interesting about this is that we often, I hear this a lot in our culture, uh, is that it's, it's a lot of Jesus language. Um, loving Jesus, following Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the sweetest name. And, and I get that because that is one of his names. When I, when I was growing up, I thought that uh, Lord was his um, kind of, what does that mean? Like Mr. Or Jesus is his first name and Christ was his last name. Um, that's not how it works, because Jesus is his name, but Christ is his title, and Lord is his title. And so when you go to things like the book of Philippians, for example, it's the most personal letter that Paul wrote, because it uses the most first-person pronouns of any letter that he wrote. I, me, my, you, or us, our, all of these very, very personal pronouns. And he tells them a lot of how he feels and what he's going through as he's in prison in Rome. And what's really interesting, I, I read this and I, I read it over and over again because I just wanted, I was thinking for my quiet time that day, I just wanted to do things like Paul. I and mean, How did he view Christ? How, what was his relationship like in this very personal letter? And you know what? There's only one time in the entire letter he uses the word Jesus by itself. Everything, and you want you to survey this. It's, it's every time it's either Jesus Christ, and Christ means the anointed one. It is the Old Testament term, Mashiach. It's the idea of, of the anointed king. And Lord is kurios, Lord, master. And so uh, the ruling one, and that's who Jesus, Yahweh saves, Jehovah saves. That's what he made it possible. But he still never forget, he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as you survey that, you see it's, it's Christ which is a term of endearment, or the Lord. It's a term of respect and endearment. And, and also, you see uh, Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, or the Lord Christ, or the Lord Jesus. There's only once that it's used, and it says, at the name of Jesus. And then it goes on what? At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and will tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And why is that? Because people call him Jesus in the Gospels all the time. It's because something radical happened at his resurrection and ascension. Because people just didn't see him as the earthly Jesus who walked along and, and was, was one of our, our, our mentors. Uh, no. He conquered death. Ascended into heaven. He's going to return. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes, he is the Lord Jesus, and I am a Jesus follower, but he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so following Jesus changes everything because he is the Lord Jesus. He is Christ. So as we think about this, how can you tell? And there's a picture of there. Do you notice that picture? What is that person doing? Well, they're, they're getting a prosthesis. So um, when my wife and I first started dating, and uh, she was a, a, a prosthetist, and so she used to make artificial limbs and braces. And so we would be going down uh, to the mall, and we'd be walking along, and then me, I'm very distractible, and so she's walking along, we're holding hands, next thing you know, she sees she's going like this, and then there I am looking at a TV in the display area. You know, it's like, hello, you know, close your mouth. That's what my dad used to say. And so um, 
But then there were times when she would say, do you see that person over there? She, they're an AK. It's like, what? Yeah, watch, watch, watch how the... What's an AK? It's above the knee amputee because they have to swing their hip forward because they don't have a knee, uh, uh, something that's an actual knee. And then one time uh, she would be walking along and she'd say, oh, there's a BK. How do you know? Because of the way they, their ankle works. And so that was a below the knee amputee. And uh, one of her, her clients was uh, a good friend of ours and and nobody, no, nobody knew he was such a good walker, as she said. And uh, he was one of her clients. And um, so one, but because he was like 6'3", and a couple of bills, as we say, uh, he would wear out his ankles pretty quickly. And then uh, it would start to, to squeak. And so he'd be walking around the office, and uh, he, they would squeak. And then he would sit down and, and uh, say, Dave, you need to get your shoes fixed. Oh, no, that's just my ankle. I need to go in and get it fixed. <laughs> you know, they would laugh. And, and they, they, didn't, they didn't, couldn't tell. And um, no, and then he would finally, he's, oh, you don't know. And he'd pull up his pant leg and they'd go, what? You know, there's an artificial leg down there. And, uh, but sometimes um, you can't tell a Christian by the way they walk. But that should never be said of us. How do you know a Christ follower? You can tell by how they walk. You can just see it. There's very distinctive marks. So here's a list for us of things that I think the scriptures teach about what a, a Christ follower looks like. So look at this. They know and walk in light of God's grand story. They just can't help it. They know it. They love it. They know the basics of it. They see that, for example, uh, in John 13, 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will come af follow afterwards. In other words, it's always about where you are right now and how does it fit into the whole story? You don't know. There's more to the story. That's how Christians walk. There's always more to the story. And there's a past to it as well. And this is what John said at the end of his gospel. He said, uh, Jesus said to him, if it, be my, if it is my will he, he, that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, it's not for you to know the future. That's for me to know, but live in light of now. But you know that I know. So don't worry about Peter and what's going to happen to him. You follow me because I know but you'll know later. We're always walking in light of the now and yet also the not yet. And also in light of what Christ has done. Uh, we also walk in God's salvation, uh, Christ's salvation in the gospel and the good news. That's what Christ calls us to. We also are, are part of the, uh, we always live in the, in the indwelling spirit. Acts 15, uh, 13, 52 says this, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. If you think about uh, what it means to look like you're walking in the Spirit, you could just tell. If you, if you read uh, Ephesians 5, you can just tell somebody who's, who walks in the Spirit. Gracious suffering. We just Christ followers want to be like Him, so they just sacrifice for other people. That's just what they do. If Christ did it, why wouldn't I? And then God's community. They're always... Always a part of God's community. They never walk alone unless something weird is happening or they're being persecuted. But they're always walking in Christ's community. And then finally, they're gospel-sharing people. They can't help it. But more than that, and finally, they don't just share the gospel and leave, I'm done, but they make disciples. They make other disciples. Do you see what we're going here? And so this is crucial. So, um, But one of the things in our culture that... Um, that is an issue is, is the way we look at discipleship and evangelism. Um, but before we do that, let me just say this. Uh, as you look at what is a discipler, I want you to be thinking about this famous passage. Now, we know this passage, and, and we think of, uh, we have a sense of, uh, and you knew we had to land here on, on, on Matthew 28, 19 and 20, but... Here is, here is what it says. Now the, 11 now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Now this is after Jesus had 
died and then rose again. And he says, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Next slide. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So I want you to be thinking about what do you notice here about what a discipler is? Well, first and foremost, they recognize that they go. And the word go there is, is often, most often when I looked it up uh, yesterday, actually on Friday, I looked it up again, and, and a lot of people say, well, it's actually after having gone or while going, and I get that. But often, uh, there are times when this kind of construction is simply a command. It's go and make disciples. They go together. And uh, also, it's always go and do something. That's the word here. Go and do this. They go together. Anytime you have the go word in, in the New Testament, it's usually associated with go and do something. And so go and make disciples. And that is the mathe taste word, make Christ followers. And then first, they have to be converts. They have to turn from something and turn to the Lord Jesus. And how do they show that? By showing that they have died to their way of new way, old way of life and they're raised to the new of life. They'd been, they died with Christ, and they're raised with him. And so then they also then teach them. This is the way it goes. they got to know stuff. But more than that, it's all that I commanded you, and that means all that I commanded you to do, and part of that is trust me. And finally, they never are alone. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You never do, are a Christ follower alone. And so as you look at this, often people think of this as, well, we just need to get more people into the church uh, and we share the gospel with them. And as soon as they get saved, I'm done. No, this is something that is crucial that we understand. Take a look at the next idea here. And that is the old view is we share, we do evangelism and then turn them over to somebody else who will disciple them. But a better view, and I think the New Testament view, is it's evangelism, and you keep evangelizing because we never get over the gospel, and then we disciple them. But when they come to faith, it's kind of an overlap. We're always with them. We're always trying to share with them. We're always trying to show them what Christ is like, what, what Christianity is like. We're always, and it's kind of this overlap. And then somehow, they just, we just keep helping them grow. That's how it works. So, uh, and then also there's this idea of discipleship and maturity. Uh, it's kind of fascinating because often we have these expectations. And uh, I want you to be thinking about where are you in the discipleship growth process? So, for example, we have some unrealistic expectations, I think. Next one. Carrying your child. You, on the, the expectation is, oh, it's going to be so great. But what really happens is accidents happen. Or uh, this other one, and you can see Leonardo decapitation. And did he ever really grow up? It doesn't seem so. Now, next, uh, let's take a look at, at, at some questions I want to, or statements that I want you to choose one. And I want you to think about where am I on this process, all right? And by the way, it, it, uh, this is no judgment here. If you're a number one, praise God for that, okay? If, if you've been a number one for 50 years, that's a problem, okay? So take a look at these. Uh, number one, I know what it means to be saved from my sin by the work of Jesus. Amen? Amen, yeah. And so... Um, if that's where you are and you're a new believer, praise God for that. I mean, that is fantastic. Number two, I know the basics of the Christian faith. Growing a little bit more, you are, you're starting to get the hang of what, what the lingo is, because sometimes what in the world is justification, you know? And uh, just a who, you know? And, uh, and then number three, I love to learn and grow in my faith. 
So this attitude is being cultivated and, and you're starting to get involved in first reading your Bible and then getting involved in other uh, situations where you just can't get enough. Number four, I regularly take time on my own to pray, worship, and read scripture. Usually that's, that's somebody who's gone through the discipleship process or at least the evangelism process and then they are now a Christian long enough that they're starting to realize this is just what, what needs to be done. Number five, I find myself in places of leadership and service. Now, these are anticipating all the other ones are true as well. Does it make sense? And so maybe this is where you are, that you find yourself as, as somebody who's, who's finding opportunities to lead folks and serve. But then there's number six. My focus is on growing in Christ and leading others to do the same. You just can't help but give it away. And that doesn't mean you have the gift of evangelism. I think the gift of evangelism is actually helping other people learn and draw them along to be able to continue to do it. Not just doing it. But maybe you just... Yeah, that's where you are, and you're just, you, you just love to see others do that. But then number seven, I'm discipling others. I, I'm, I'm not only giving it away, but I'm helping people grow, and that's fantastic. Maybe that's how you do it with your kids, and you're, and you're helping your children learn and grow, or, or a family member. That's great. But notice the final one, because Jesus said, go into the entire world. To all nations. So I am discipling uh, people who are discipling others. Now, I want you to be thinking about which number are you? Which number are you? And, and there's no, this is not a shame thing. This is about just helping us realize there is so much more. There is so much more. And giving our lives away to something that really matters. Something that will take generations to accomplish. But then looking back, we just go, praise God for Ardeth Summers. Who shared the gospel with me when I was five years old at my mom's Good News Club. But praise God for my mom for putting that in our home every Tuesday afternoon at three o'clock. Or for T.G. Anderson, who loved Jesus shared with him everything, anything that breathed, moved from Sweden to uh, the United States in the, in the 1800s. And then his son, Ray, who then moved to Seattle and wanted to be uh, used by the Lord, so he, he wanted to create a, 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 the first Christian bookstore in Seattle. And then his son, who... Uh, Wanted to serve the Lord and uh, wanted to make sure that their kids grew up in the faith and married a wonderful lady who, who loved the Lord and would make sure that those kids understood the word of God and prayed and saw her praying and loving the Lord and giving to others. Those, that was my mom and dad. We pass it on. It's intentional. At least in that context. So, let me ask you a question. Next, why don't we get discipled? Well, I think one of the reasons is because we think in our minds is that being a good Christian is what we know. Becoming mega minds uh, about knowing a bunch of Bible knowledge. Now, by the way, I, I'm a theologian. I teach at a Christian college, a Christian university. I teach the Bible all the time. I read it all the time. It's a hobby. It's a calling. It's, it's my passion. And I want other people to... But that's not the only thing. We don't just pass on knowledge. We pass on the affective, the heart behind it, and the relationship with the Lord, and the skills that go with it as well. So, uh, next, um, here's another reason. Our culture says, don't bother. Now, I, this is a fascinating little uh, chart, but if you think about it, one of the reasons we don't is because we think about um, pluralism. We're, the world is constantly trying to squeeze us into its mold, saying, uh, hey, whatever you're into, yeah, it is okay. Whatever you're into. Hey, if you're a Christian, hey, that's good for you. If that works for you, great. It's not for me, because that's... Uh, and then uh, relativism. 
Whatever you believe in is okay. It doesn't matter, you know, just, just keep it to yourself. But that's great. Uh, glad it works for you. Privatization. Uh, wherever you, um, whatever you believe, uh, keep it to yourself. And I think we've really struggled uh, with, with, um, with COVID and, and, and just not really getting back into the, out of the privatization. Uh, we have to be very careful about letting the world squeeze us into its mold. We have to give it away because it matters for the next generation. And so um, let me give you some uh, excuses um, about this. I don't know enough. That's okay. Number two, I don't have enough time. Uh, nobody does. Uh, but again, here's some permissions. You don't have to be omniscient. Only God is omniscient. And you got lots of people in the church here that can help you. And if you can't answer the question, guess what? Here's a really great answer. Hey, you know, I, I don't have a great answer for you today, but let's get together next week over coffee or, or lunch, and, and uh, I, I'll, I'll have a better answer for you. And you can keep it going. Isn't that fantastic? It's a great way to get out of questions you can't answer. But it's still our responsibility to try to do the best we can. We don't have to be omniscient. It's okay. Also, we don't have to be omnipresent everywhere except, you know, if you're a mom. And uh, timeless. Um, my mom, I, how did she know the things I was doing? It, it's just amazing. I mean, it's not just the uh, eyes in the back of the head thing. I think she really was omniscient. But anyway, but think about it. Uh, you, only God is, are the, is those things. And so it's boundaries, right? You have boundaries and margins in your life. You need to keep those. And I need to keep those. But we also need to do the things that matter most for eternity and for the next generation. And I hope that you're thinking about Amity Christian Church. What was it going to look like in 20 years? 40 years? 50 years? Will there be faithful people here who pour into the lives of others, who don't just pass on knowledge, but pass on a passion for the Lord Jesus Christ? And being Christ followers changes everything. So with this, uh, how do we? Well, unless you're ready, unless you really want to, I, I, there's not a lot. I'm not going to give you a bunch of different things. But how do we start? We start first with the, with the folks on the right. And that is, those are my kids uh, probably 15 years ago. Uh, the, the little kid that's got, going like this, he's 6'4 and a couple of bills. I mean, he's a big boy. And uh, he's 26, and, and uh, the other kids, I mean, they're all grown up, but that's what you do. That's what we do. We first men, disciple our own kids. We lead them to faith, and not just to believe and pray a prayer, right? Right? That we are there for them and help answer questions and model for them what it means to be a true Christ follower. Turn with me to a, 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 just two passages left as we're wrapping this up. Uh, turn to Psalm 78. Uh, Psalm, I don't know if you realize this, but discipleship is in the Old Testament. This is not just a New Testament thing. So Psalm 78 is fascinating. Because, and, and I actually, uh, I, I just not seen it in this context before. This is really, everybody I think knows, if you've been around the church for a while, you know um, the Shema, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what we sang this morning, right? That's the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. Shema is simply the word meaning hear, listen. Hey, let's go. And that's uh, what that passage is. But then right after that, it says, and I, and I want you to take the law and teach to your kids when they rise up, when they lay down, and when you're walking in the way, share and help them know so that they may be careful to do all that it says and follow Yahweh. But later, this Psalm 78 is fascinating. Listen to verse 1 in Psalm 78. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the work, words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. I got lots to say. Which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. But it's not just that. He says, 
We will not conceal them from their children, but tell them to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wondrous works that He has done. We're going to tell everything about what Christ done for us, what God has done for us. Verse 5. These verse 5 through 7 are crucial. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children. And notice this, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. And what? What are they trying to tell them? Just God's law? Do the right thing. Obey God. Listen to do's and don't. No. What is it? That they should put their confidence or trust in God. No matter what, no matter the circumstances, trust in God, even when it doesn't make sense. And it goes on, and not forget the works of God. Your family should have men... Um, um, Moments in your history that are just family stories of God's power and grace. There's always another chapter. And there always has been other chapters of God's great works. And then, but, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. I'm just saying. And then it says, and do not be like their fathers. And if you want to see how it went horribly wrong without it, read the rest of the psalm. Because it gets ugly fast. Trust, teach, yet to be born. Think forward. What does my life and my mentoring, my discipling people around me, what will that do 10 years, 15 years, 30 years down the road? It will matter. And then finally, oh, by the way, family first, the little kid on the right, that's my grandson. That's, that's Felix. And we saw him yesterday, and his parents are great and godly. But it also means that we do that as well. They need to see Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and, and Grandpa and Grandma are Christ followers. And it comes up in our languages. Our, it comes up in famous family stories. Have you ever heard the story about when... No, Grandpa, tell me. Well, let me tell you this great story of God's mercy and grace. So, final thing. Where are we? Now what? Now what do we do? Oh, by the way, a couple others. Let me just say this. The, these are two guys that I met with for probably six or seven years every Saturday. And we just hung out. In fact, they are just great guys. In fact, many times they discipled me in situations that I was going through. And then, by the way, just so you know, there's certain skills. I don't know how this got in there, but that's my son, Stephen, the big one. And I taught him how to make chalk outline with masking tape um, because it was fun. Uh, that is right outside the faculty lounge where your uh, pastor hangs out a lot. Okay, anyway, next one. All right. So I want you, now what do we do? Uh, first and foremost, let me just uh, go back to the, the one through eight. You need to ask yourself, are you a Christ follower or are you just a fan? Because it matters. Following the Lord Jesus is everything. Why would I want to do that? Because he died for you in your place on your behalf, suffered and died and took all your sins upon himself. Past, present, and future. You can't make it up. I can't make it up. I'll never be good enough. How good is good enough? It's never good enough. You ever been that time when you were a kid and you did something wrong, you know you displeased your parents and you go, well, I'll make it up. I'm just going to be really good to make it up and then maybe they'll, you know, the, the tension and I, you can't make it up with God. You never can. He has to go back to Jesus Christ in my place, on my behalf. If you've never done business, that's what it means to be a Christ follower. Why would I want to follow him? Because he gave himself for me. I'll follow him anywhere. But more than that, 
Where are you in the discipleship pathway? One final passage. You've got to listen to 1 John chapter 2. And we, we, we sang a song that is just right after this about not loving the, word, the world. You know that? And that, I love that song. The words are great. And, uh, and yet just before that, the two verses before that, three verses before that, uh, John says this, because he's giving the, these churches of Asia Minor uh, tests for seeing who's really in fellowship with God. Because there was a lot of pretenders. And he says, there's clear standards. And then he says this, I'm writing to you little children. Because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. In other words, you're children because you're his, you know the gospel. You accepted the gospel into your life. You know who Jesus is. You know he died on the cross for you. That's great. I'm writing to you. I'm writing to you fathers. Oh, interesting. Because you know him who has, has been from the beginning. Whoa. Whoa. There's something about being a spiritual father and walking with God for a while that you just go, I know the whole story and I know that it doesn't end with the trial that I'm going through or the one that you're facing right now. Let me show you how you can hope in God because I've been doing it for a while. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. And, I, and he goes, yeah, you are a young man because you're starting to do battle with the evil one and you're starting to see the Lord work and conquer bad things in your life. I have written to you children because you know the Father. Yeah, it's the basics. I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. And I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Maybe you feel like you're doing well in your walk with the Lord and you're not sinning like you used to and you know God's word, but the next step is being a spiritual father to give birth to others and help them grow. So in these final questions, where are you on the discipleship pathway? Child, young man, father, it's time for self-evaluation, right? I can say that because I'm not your pastor. Who has made the biggest impact in your life for Christ? You got to think back. Who has made the greatest impact on your life for Christ? Why? How? What does it mean for you to grapple with the reality that you can and should impact someone else for life, uh, someone's life for Christ? At least start there. What would it mean for you to say, I want to just at le least be available to think about it? And you know, the first step is talk to, talk to the Lord Jesus. Just say, okay, I'm following you. This scares me to death. I'm feeling so inadequate. I, or I really don't want to do this because it takes too much time. Or uh, what do I have to share? And he'll just come back and say, trust me. You don't have to do it alone. It's not going to take over your life. Because you're just going to allow me to take over your life. Again and again. And I'll bless you. And then finally, how can you make yourself available to be discipled? Maybe you've never been discipled. Maybe it's time to go up to someone here at church or to Pastor Ryan and just say, I, I need somebody to walk with me through some things. And then how can you make yourself available to disciple someone? I want to just take a minute. I want you to think about these questions, where you are on the discipleship path, do business with the Lord, and then I'll close in prayer. Oh, Lord Christ, we thank you for being our Savior, but we also thank you for being the great example of how to live life the way God would want. And we pray that you would help us to follow you to the point of sacrificing our comfort and our time and our egos and allowing you to work through us to disciple others so that the church may continue to grow 
and how you may be glorified because the, the more Christ followers there are, the more you get glory. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.